Hey everybody, Joe here from the Lines Led by Donkeys podcast, but uh, I guess you probably already knew that. If you like what we do here on the show, consider supporting us on Patreon at www.patreon.com slash lines led by donkeys. Just $5 per month gets you every regular episode early, access to our community discord, a digital copy of my book, The Hooligans of Kandahar, as well as its audiobook read by me, and over five years of bonus content. By supporting the show, you support us and allow us to keep our show as it has always been ad-free. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Lines Led by Donkeys podcast. If you are shocked to hear me doing the intro, it's Tom uh, hosting the Red Army Faction series for part three. And with me is Joe. Hello. Uh, Tom is just me putting on an elaborate Irish accent because uh, everybody knows how good <laughs> I am at accents. And I almost cut in and did the intro before you because I forgot I'm not supposed to do that for the next couple weeks. <laughs> look, look, we've talked about this. I am uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> little, little peek behind the scenes here that Tom and Nate know all too well. I am a control freak when it comes to the topics and the show in general. Production, all you guys, everything else, I pick over the fine tooth comb like a crazy person. So handing over the steering wheel to someone else, I think it causes my heart to shudder. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, Joe. It's okay. At least I didn't do the intro. At least I didn't do the intro in German this time. Oh uh, no, that's only for special occasions. Unless it's Nate and we talk about literally anything to do with Germany, and he he <laughs> he does the German version of a David Badil accent, which I love. <laughs> so how are you, Joe? I'm good, actually. It's not. I'm not burning to death today, uh, which is you know a nice change of pace. It's the last several times we've, uh, we've uh, recorded. I have my water back. Um, uh, it's for for people who aren't a part of our group chat and hear me complain all the time. I did not have water for two days, uh, which led to a cross city trek to uh, for me to find. So, so like you know, I don't know how toilets look in the UK. Uh, you know, like American toilets can just take. Wait, how do you not? How do you not know what to you've been in the UK? Did you just? I was not in a hotel. <laughs> hotel toilets are a different breed, my man. Um, True. Like yeah. in the US, you run out of water. You know, you, it's easy to find jugs of water at like your corner store, or whatever. You take the reservoir top off of it. You dump water in the back. You get a you get a working toilet until you know you mm -hmm. can use it. So you can shit at home, right? So you're not just like making a layer cake of shit uh, while you wait for your water to come back on. We do not have that here. Um, we have those weird toilets where the plunger is directly in the middle. And if you take, you have to kind of take apart your toilet to get the top off, which I learned in my last apartment, which I think I've talked about before. I do not know how to do. And I broke my toilet. Oh, this is the time you broke the yeah. toilet. <laughs> uh, so this time I'm like, ah, oh, fuck. I, <laughs> it was right after we got done recording the part two of this series. I'm like, oh boy, I got to run to the bathroom. No water. I'm like, Oh fuck! Right, um, and you can't. <laughs> you were running. You're running to the closest toilet at a 45 degree angle, and it wasn't just my apartment. It was half of the city. <laughs> I live in the capital, so like that is a catastrophic water failure, right? Oh. Um, and I live in the city center, so the entire ring of of Kentron district, no water, right? I'm frantically running to all the cafes in the area looking for a functioning bathroom nothing there's no real public bathrooms here and knowing how government services here you would not want to use them um it would look like the bathroom out of fucking train spotting and uh so i just i end up walking like s several kilometers <laughs> looking f i go on you know the arduous the arduous march but for taking a shit and i finally find my friend's bar who i'm good friends with who he's like yeah whenever the city loses water and power for some reason i still have it so I, I look him dead in the eye. I'm like, man, I didn't come here for a beer. I just need to take a shit. He's like, no, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> did he give you a beer to have while you're on the toilet? I mean, I did afterwards buy like two pints and then I went home because I'm like, I just, I, I feel bad. <laughs> Everyone goes on about, you know, shower beers. What about toilet beers? Look, I would be fine with that if it was like a bottle of beer, not like an open topped pint. You don't want your pint basking in the shit vapors of like a panic shit that's been brewing for three hours. Yeah, we we have we have talked uh, privately about 
you know, the signs of when you walk into a bathroom that someone has just obliterated and it's just that strange humidity <laughs> in the air. It's awful. It's so bad. Especially when it's like 100 degrees. It's like, I don't know how many uh, uh, how many degrees Celsius that is because I refuse to learn even though I live in a country that uses Celsius. Uh, like my friends are like, oh man, it's like 30 out. I'm like, in the back of my head, I'm like, wow, that's cold. Uh, but you know, it's not. Um, I what, what I'm trying to say here is I am I'm a stupid man. Tom. <laughs> <laughs> but like I, I had the exact same experience. Uh, was it last year or this year? So I used to live in an absolute shithole place. Uh, we moved there when uh, I had moved over to the UK, had a month in like a play, like an Airbnb that we rented for super cheap and was like, you know, like, OK, we have to find somewhere by the end of the month or otherwise we have to sleep on the street. Found somewhere the Friday before we had to move, we had to move out on the su- on the Sunday. Place was was sharing it with like eight other people. It was terrible. And one one day the uh, the shower completely broke, and I was like, "Oh fuck!" I have to r- I have to ring the property manager, who's like a massive dickhead, and say, "Shower's broke. Can you fix it?" And he was like, "Yeah." And then he came, and because this was like I actually looked up the model of unit that was in this shower. It's like an, elect- an electrical shower. It cost fifty pounds for the entire unit, so you know it's just complete dog shit. <laughs> right. And it had like one of those shower heads on it that like strips your skin off. That like it's like okay, there's like sixteen outlets on this head, and like the water is coming out at like a million psi, so it feels like you're being shot. Okay, compared to my current shower head, I prefer that. No water pressure to speak of. If I had hair, I would be upset. But actually, well, actually, no, you probably can't get it delivered to Armenia. But there was there is a model of shower head that I found online because on TikTok, there's all like, oh, these, you know, shower heads that like fit, have like these beads in it that filter hard water and increase pressure. It's all bullshit. No, you need a water but softener. Actually, <laughs> yeah. So you need. But I found. Fa- I found one that actually helped with low pressure water and like worked and isn't like this bullshitty one. So I keep buying that same one again. Um, I found it like years ago. But this guy comes over and is like trying to figure out what's wrong with the shower and says, oh, it's the shower head that you put on it broke. And I'm like, no, it fucking didn't. Shut up. Anything that makes it so it's not his fault. And you know what the worst thing is? He he like took the shower head and the hose that I put on and took it with him. And I'm like, Oi, bro, you got a license for that shower head? <laughs> and like, he was like, he took it with him and he was like, oh, it broke the shower. So I have to take it with me. He's like, that's my property. Like, fuck off. Look, as, as an Armenian sitting in Armenia, this has happened to us many times. <laughs> <laughs> like, so the shower, was, first your shower the heads, was, then your children, uh, <laughs> first the shower heads, then you know genocide. They came for the shower um, heads, and I said nothing because I did not need a shower. <laughs> then they came for our toilets, and I said nothing because I didn't need to shit. Because I shit my friend's bar. <laughs> so uh, we didn't have a shower for like two weeks or something. And That's brutal. I, and I had to like shower in the gym, shower in the studio, and like. It was hot as well. So I was like having to shower every day. And there was like days where it's like, I just, I'm going to work from home because I can't, I can't face having to walk for like 20 minutes to the gym, just to shower and then walk back. See, I'm a daily shower guy. I blame the army for that, for making me live. I'm a daily shower person for too. like living weeks and months sometimes without a shower. And when I was out of water, I'm like, ah, I have a gym membership. I will go to my gym and take a shower. And I walk in, there's a big sign with like, this is an Armenian with a, like a frowny face under like, sorry, no water. I'm just like, fuck. <laughs> but most importantly, are you a night shower or a morning shower? Depends. Depends. Uh, I'm a shower as soon as I get done with the gym uh, guy, mm. and it depends on when I go to the gym. On days where I don't work out, I'm a night shower guy. Oh, freak. I gotta, I gotta get into freak. my cl- fucking clean sheets, man. No, no. Nobody no. wants to crawl into bed with someone who just fucking reeks like the day. I mean, that that's up to you. I shower in the morning, and then I shower after the gym, so technically I... And for anyone who's gonna try and get at me saying you shouldn't shower twice a day... I do not care. No, it's totally like on hot days. I'll take a five second cold shower. Like I will probably yeah. do it after we finish this podcast because my office is starting to cook. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Don't worry. Like 
the studio is like hermetically sealed. Oh, yeah, and if I there remember. is more than one person in here, it gets so hot. When I recorded the one time in the TF studios uh, back in December uh, with Nate, we were sitting exactly where you're sitting right now. And uh, even though it was cold as fuck in London, by the end of it, I was cooking. Yeah, yeah. It's like hermetically sealed. There's no ventilation. And it's like, you can just slowly feel it pick up. And Nate didn't say a single thing, but I definitely farted like several times while we were recording. <laughs> and your fart was lingering it, it there and saying like, I'm not locked in here with you. You're <laughs> locked in here with me. I, I'm used to working by myself, man. Like every once in a while I forget there's someone else in the room with me. <laughs> He, he's just like Paul Atreides, but rather than recycling his sweat, your respiratory system is recycling the same parts. <laughs> huffing my shit gas for an hour and a half. Oh, so talking about people who don't shower and probably smelled. Um, I knew it. We are, <laughs> we are on part three of our series on the Red Army faction. If you haven't listened to the past two episodes, go listen to them. Nothing in this episode will make sense if you haven't. I don't know why you would listen to part three of a four-part series. I always say that as well. Like, hey, this is part four. If, you, if you're if you just joining us today, go back and listen to the other three parts. I don't know who would do that. But some people just like to watch the world fucking burn, man. Yeah, they, you know, this isn't House of Leaves. This is a sequ- sequential <laughs> series. I'm going to do a House of Leaves-esque series and just uh, not tell anybody what order I'm recording them in. And you'll have to listen to them like the guy from Memento. <laughs> this is the dune of podcasting. You can listen to them in any order you like, but no, there's a proper order you should. But when we last left you off, the Red Army faction, Bader Meinhof group, were holed up in a, sanat- in a cold sanatorium and were slowly getting at each other's throats. But by the new year, there was a crisis in the group. More members were now in custody than were actually living on the run. Tensions were running at an all-time high, and soon the first defector, Bede Sturm, would leave the group, and by January 1971, there were, they were once again running low on funds. By the 15th of January 1971, two banks in Castle were raided, both branches of the local savings bank, um, and at 9.30am, five group members drove up to the Akademiestrasse uh, branch in a Mercedes, they had stolen in Guttingen, and uh, one man stayed in the car, the rest of them entered the bank. They were all dressed in identical black clothing and had balaclavas showing only their eyes down over their faces. German ISIS. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> German IRA, more like. Hey, the, this is the, the guy in all black with balaclava and a Kalashnikov uh, uh, loop, okay? You all end up looking the same. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, is that like, if anyone had paid attention, they would have immediately known it was, you know, they would have spotted Andreas Bader because he would have inevitably had cut a hole in his balaclava for a cigarette. <laughs> like, I cannot tell you how many, like, you know, reference documents I looked at where they mentioned Andreas Bader was smoking at the very specific time that they're talking about him. Like, he was just constantly rolling and smoking cigarettes. Outstanding. It reminds me, like, there's a certain kind of guy, like, I know people that will, will only chain smoke when they're drinking, right? And it reminds yeah, me, it, my, myself included, and then I feel awful the next day because I don't even smoke anymore. Um, and it reminds me of this, uh, there's a story of like an Italian politician who had to be hospitalized for nicotine toxicity because he smoked yeah. <laughs> several hundred cigarettes in a single day. And someone did the math and there was like a cigarette every two minutes. Jesus Christ. Like, to be fair, when we were in Dublin, I think we smoked six packs of cigarettes in the space of three days. Hey, we had Robert Evans help us with that. Yeah, true. (laughs) So the group, this is the raid. This is a raid. One of them shouted and told everyone to keep their hands up, keep still, and you won't be harmed. They fired two warning shots into the ceiling and overall they took 54,185 Deutschmarks. The second team, also disguised in the same way, rushed into the second bank, said the same thing again, uh, one of them jumped on the counter and stuffed 60,530 Deutschmarks into his pocket. And Gudrun Essling uh, sent two parcels of money to the group's uh, Stuttgart department's headquarters the same day. And a third parcel arrived the following week later. Just so mailing a giant sack of cash. I just want to know how 
big their pockets were if they could fit 60,000 Deutschmarks in it's, it. That's a whole new level of dad cargo pants. <laughs> that's like all the Zoomers bringing back Jinko jeans. Jinko cargo pants. Now that's a cursed combination. <laughs> got the, you, got, you got the ridiculous flare at the bottom. That's just everyone in Blink-182 in like circa 2001 wearing the big dicky shorts. It, oh God, what if Blink-182 was German and robbed a bank? They would have to sing the entire like uh, like say all their commands but only nasally as fuck oh my god it is blink 182 <laughs> work sucks i know work sucks i know put the money in the fucking bag <laughs> um by february astrid prol and manfred grashoff two members of the group would be involved in a shootout with police with a police officer who had recognized them in a frankfurt cafe while he was having his lunch although nobody was harmed this would begin the first real hunt for the Bader Meinhof group. The apartments Ruland had named were searched and people who had sheltered the terrorists were arrested and questioned. The press got in on the act and details uh, from the interrogation of Karls Heinz Ruland were, uh, going, were going around torn out of context, distorted and exaggerated. The Hamburger Morgan Post news wrote, <laughs> by now... I'm sorry, I know that just means, like, a newspaper from Hamburg, but I'm American, I can't laugh when, it's by, when something's called Hamburger. Uh, they wrote, by now the hunt for the members of the gang seems to be developing into a kind of hysteria. In the last few days, the police have been alerted by a dozen or so erroneous reports, which have kept officers all over the Federal Republic busy. Now, at this stage, there is, you know... A, a kind of huge hysteria around, you know, the Bader Meinhof group, which we're going to talk about right now. They, they were beginning to be recognized more frequently by shop owners, hotel staff, and people on the street. At one stage, a woman who was suspected of being Ulrika Meinhof was arrested by police after receiving a tip off. The woman was dragged out of a hotel, fingerprinted, but subsequently released once they figured out she was an Ulrika Meinhof. I love the idea that there's like a because whenever I think of hysteria, any kind of hysteria, especially in the era that I grew up in, I think of that stupid shit like, oh, is your teen wearing too many bracelets? That means they suck dick at high school or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, is your teen not showering? Could they be part of a left wing militia group? <laughs> <laughs> oh, everyone is going to be just very uh, angry at us for uh, calling uh, left-wing mil- paramilitary groups smelly. But... Look, every paramilitary group is smelly. They're paramilitaries. They have other important things to do. That's because everyone talks about bedtime being authoritarian, but in reality, it's actually showers. <laughs> yeah, but showering is bourgeoisie. <laughs> the, old, the, the real proletariat smell like ball sweat all the time. <laughs> so, Karl Heinz ruling statements about those middle class people who were sheltering the group provided the popular press with headlines day after day and really at this time there's a huge media storm building around the group and like you know you have the right wing press like Bill saying badder gang blackmails the prominent the welt uh, or the welt uh, sympathizers hamper hunt for badder group the hamburger Adenblatt uh, celebrities protect badder gang build once again pastor hit Hid Bader's gang's loot, talking about uh, S. Ling's uh, father. I'm trying really hard not to make like an outer blot hamburger joke. And uh, I, look, I'm, I'm a simple man. I hear hamburger, I laugh. I texted you last night to say that there is a name in this script that you are going to lose your mind at. And I'm just going it, to, it's going to be in a while. And for anyone listening, you will know immediately because Joe is going to fucking freak out. But you might be thinking to yourself, why are the papers still referring to them as the Bader Meinhof group? Well, it wasn't until now that the group got its official title as the Red Army Faction. Horst Mahler, who is once again in prison, um, also for anyone who is familiar with this history, is you're going to have fun in part four with Horst Mahler. Uh, while he was in prison for his role of freeing Bader from prison, uh, wrote the group's first manifesto, manifesto on urban guerrilla warfare. The paper was met with indignation by those on the run as intellectually insufficient. Sick burn. Instead, Ulrika Meinhof was chosen to write the official first declaration of the group's philosophy. It was called the Urban Guerrilla Concept. And I actually recommend you go read it because it is like, it, it's really interesting the kind of, because the political, 
and psychological viewpoint of the group. It, it's really compelling, and I have some bits pulled out on it at the moment that I'm going to read in a second. So it contained the first use of the phrase Red Army Faction. The title page bore the emblem of, emblem of a submachine gun with the abbreviation RAF above it. The name and the emblem soon became the group's trademarks. But it was not a Kalashnikov, the Russian submachine gun, the weapon of all liberation movements in the world at this time and, you know, subsequently going forward. Before gun nerds um, get on us, yes, we are aware that the AK-47 is not a submachine gun. <laughs> yes, it's the AK-74, blah, blah, blah. I AK-74 had, I too was played a carbine! Call of Duty. It was a carbine! <laughs> <laughs> why did call of duty categorize it as a Don't submachine make me gun? go to the next room and get my 74 <laughs> <laughs> do it <laughs> instead of the ak serving as the raf's revolutionary symbol it was the german heckler and coke mp5 kind of a mistake using the symbol of you know german state power as a, your revolutionary symbol. It would be like an American left-wing group using, like, I don't know, a bald eagle or a police badge. <laughs> Joe, I think you call, I think it's called patriotic socialism. <laughs> You're fired. So, You're fired. <laughs> I, I love to see how many times in a single episode I can make you say that. So, page one of the Urban Guerrilla Concept quoted Chairman Mao, if the enemy fights us, that is good, not bad. And further said, if the enemy opposes us vigorously, paints us in the blackest of colours, and will allow us no good points, that is even better. It shows that not only have we drawn a clear dividing line between ourselves and the enemy, our work has also proved brilliantly successful. Many comrades, mine off road, are spreading lies about us. They make capital out of the fact that we stayed in their homes, they organised our journey to the Middle East, they knew about contacts and apartments. They, they said they did something for us, although they do, they're doing nothing. Some of them just want to show that they are in. Some are trying to prove that we are foolish, unreliable, incautious, burnt out. Thereby, they prejudice others against us. In reality, they are only judging us by themselves. They are consumers. We have nothing to do with these chatterers from whom anti-imperialist fight is conducted at coffee parties. They are... <laughs> There are plenty who do not gossip, who have some idea of resistance, who are sick enough of it all to wish us well, because they know that none of it is worth lifelong integration and adaptation. We do not make reckless use of guns. The cop who finds himself in the contradictory situation of being a little man and a capitalist lackey, a low-wage earner and a police officer of monopoly capitalism is not under absolute compulsion to act. When we shoot, when we are shot at, we spare the cop who spares us. All right. With two things, bold of them to be like, yeah, we went to an illegal uh, PLO training camp. Um, in two, yeah, let her cook. Yeah, like this, but this is just like Milo from Trash Futures, like Brendan O'Neill speech at the start of every live show. Like, you know, the chattering classes, like, you know, re they're really taking aim at a Pim's Cup you know, petty bourgeoisie. The Pims. <laughs> she goes on to say, People are right when they claim that all the resources expended on hunting us down are really intended for the whole socialist left in the Federal Republic and West Berlin. The small sums of money we are said to have stolen, the occasional thefts of cars and documents which we are charged, and the attempted murder they are char trying to pin on us are their justification for it all. Yeah, but they did try to kill a guy. They're really she was really cooking in this though. You know, this this is the one thing that I will say. Um Ulrika Meinhoff is a fantastic writer and you can really tell anything of their like, you know, their press releases or whatever you can really tell when it wasn't written by her. Yeah, I can imagine whenever Botter writes something it's like, yeah, this was written by Andrea. Like this is written by the other guy. This is not written by Ulrika Meinhoff. <laughs> Hold on to that thought. At the very end of this episode, I'm going to come back to that. <laughs> so, on the 6th of May, 1971, Astrid Prohl was recognised by a petrol pump attendant in Hamburg and arrested by the police. The detective, the detective officers wanted to keep her arrest secret. They had found a key ring in her bag and were looking for the apartment it belonged to, expecting to find more members of the group there. The police drew a circle with a radius of 500 metres around the spot where she had been arrested. 
The officers then fanned out to try and find the lock which fitted the front door key. They they would spend three days putting three different keys in 2,164 locks, unbeknownst to people living in the buildings. <laughs> Who's at the door? Oh, it's just the federal police. I don't know what they're... they're looks like they're trying to break in. It, yeah, it's like that joke. is like, how many people does it take to screw in a light bulb? How many police officers does it take to put a key in a lock? I can imagine they deployed hundreds of officers to do this, and they succeeded in doing nothing. Well, on the third day, they found the right lock. It belonged to an apartment on the third floor of number 139 Lubecker Strasse. However, all they found were the fingerprints of Gudrun Ensling, Andreas Bader, and no one else, and papers showing that the group were planning to attack vans carrying money from the Hamburg Savings Bank to the Armoured Car Service. By June 15th, 3,000 police officers were mobilised all over North Germany in order to hunt down the group. This would officially mark the 420, 425th day of the search for the group. And they have more than, they've done slightly more than nothing at this point. Yeah, this will all change. Because on the 15th of June, 1971, at 2.15pm, that day Petra Schlem was stopped at a checkpoint driving a BMW which was already synonymous with the group and was jokingly referred to as the Bader Meinhof wagon. Why the fuck were they still using it? No, they were just stealing different BMWs. But this one particular kind of BMW is like their calling card. So they were, the police were, you know, told to look out for BMWs with powerful engines because that's, they were stealing BMWs with powerful engines so they could, you know, get away quicker they could you know maneuver better so they were targeting specific models of bmw so the police were just like okay look out for these handful of bmw models and anyone you see stop them still you're trying to be like urban gorillas and you know that the federal government has deployed what is effectively like a division of infantry to go find you like now we should probably keep doing the same thing (laughs) um so she attempted to speed away from the checkpoint but was chased by the police but abandoned the car and attempted to run away on foot. Yeah, good job. You're Petra, definitely faster than a car. Petra ran into a building site and uh, Werner Hoppe, Schlem's companion, hid under a crane. When surrounded, Hoppe surrendered, surrendered, you know, putting his hands above his head and walking towards the police. But Schlem chose to draw her pistol and fire at the police who told her not to, who told her not to be a fool and surrender. She fired again and they returned, hitting her in the head, making Petra Schlem the first member of the Red Army faction to be killed by the police. I mean, in reality, what kind of prison time are they even looking at at this point? I mean, like you could burn down a fucking department. You could burn down a department store with people inside and get like a couple years. Realistically, I'd say they probably wa- they probably would have gotten between about five to ten years at this stage because you know, the the amount of charges that they're after collecting, because, like, the department store fire was just one incident. At this stage, they've been stealing cars, doing bank robberies, you know, shooting at police. Yeah, I mean, it seems like the German criminal justice system at the time was quite lax with these things up until you probably kill someone, which they haven't done yet. I, I would take five to ten years in prison bef- bef- uh, you know, between that and getting my head canoed by a guy named Fritz with a service revolver. After the death of Petra Schlem, a poll showed that one in four West Germans under the age of 30 felt sympathy for the group in what would come to be known as their War of Six versus 60 million. I like those odds. I'm sure this ends, I'm sure this ends with the, the, the Federal Socialist Republic of West Germany. So over the course of the summer, the preparations for more decisive actions were to be made. The Socialist Patience Collective a group founded out of a sort of political and philosophical therapy group that sought to reframe illness as the contradictions created by capitalism, which... Uh, Fucking what? Yeah, anyone who's read Mark Fisher knows what kind of what they're talking about, that, you know, it's about, like, stuff like mental health, you know, a lot of, like, me- mental health is created by the pressures that are created by capitalism. I think I'm gonna have a fucking stroke. I mean, that, that's, uh, to be fair, that is effectively what the Soviet Union believed as well, was like mental health uh, or mental illness doesn't exist um, in our society, just like, you know, 
de- like a deeply depraved serial murderers don't. Uh, so they just tried to brush under the rug, ignore it, or throw you in prison uh, for being mentally ill, which thankfully nobody in the world does anymore. Um, yeah, that's that's deeply fucked. Uh, the political ideology has nothing to do with your mental or physical health. Now, I will say as a counterpoint, they weren't necessarily saying that mental health and stuff doesn't exist in the way that the Soviet Union did to some, to some well, extent. No, 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 I'm not saying that either, but I'm saying like, uh, you know, they're of, of point A to point B to 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 point C on this on this graph point C being the you know uh mental health or mental illness does not exist in our communist utopia they're solidly in in B territory well what their argument was that you know essentially the pressures of living under capitalism exacerbate any kind of issues that already exist so it's just kind of this is the problem with trying to summarize stuff for a, a 17 page script <laughs> I, I get it to some extent, but it, it seems terribly reductive. <laughs> mental health, very complicated. So they wanted to reframe it, mental illness as a contradiction created by capitalism, which could be embraced to bring an end to the system which gave it life. W- uh, and they would be affirmed in their support of the RAF and their willingness to go underground you know, by the de- because of the death of Petra Schlem. Klaus Junschk uh, would travel to join the group and... Um, I have a really funny anecdote about Klaus. So he was part of the SPK, this socialist pension collective, and they, you know, they weren't as, you know, radical as the RAF because they weren't, you know, blowing shit up. They sought to do, you know, small acts of transgression to undermine the state while traveling to meet the RAF. And this isn't in the script. This is just something that's really funny in the book and some of the documents is he got stopped by police because obviously there's police checkpoints everywhere and you were required to show your papers when you're asked for identification. So he handed over his papers. And you know what he had put over his picture on his papers? RAF logo. No, a picture of Chairman Mao. Oh, God. He's just, they're slowly becoming like socialists, uh, sovereign citizens. <laughs> um, he was, you know, arrested by the police <laughs> for this, for, you know, presenting falsified documents, blah, 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 blah. But... When he eventually met the group, he was interviewed by Ulrika Meinhof. There were political and philosophical questions that he was asked to determine his, determine his dedication. He had smartened himself up uh, to an unusual degree uh, for his first meeting with the outlaws. He was wearing a blazer, a white shirt, a tie, and grey trousers. Kind of like he's going for a job interview. Yeah, I was about to say, it looks like you, you know, uh, your, your, your first warehouse job uh, interview, you have to try to l- look slightly better than you are without knowing the situation where, you know, everybody there is on the run and disgusting because they can't stay in one spot for too long. And they're like, why did you bring a tie to this event? <laughs> this is business casual. You know, did you not read the, you know, Google invite we sent you? You have to wear, uh, you have to wear a revolutionary casual, which is a a top that looks vaguely military esque, but you bought at a chain store. Um, a, a decent uh, pair of boots that w- you probably stole, if especially if you're Andreas Bader. Um, <laughs> and a pair of pants with the biggest cargo pockets you've ever seen. Yep. Yeah. Um. So, uh, well, tell us who you are and what you do," said Ulrika Meinhof. Jungs uh, told his life story, about which, as he realized from their questions, his un- interlocutors were already well informed. When you when they came from the Socialist Patients Collective, Ulrika Meinhof said abruptly, "But we don't go for group sex here." Klaus replied, "What makes you think I'm inter- interested in group sex?" And I know you've made jokes about, you know, the leftist polycule. These people were decidedly anti-sex. Yeah, the, coming is a bourgeoisie privilege. We practice yeah. strict semen retention here. <laughs> Towards the end of the conversation, the others indicated that Jonsk, uh, could what he could do for the group. There were various things it's important for us to get done. We can't do them ourselves without running risks. Stuff that has to be bought and prepared and such and such. Uh, the principal requirement was car number plates. They obviously are stealing cars, they need doctored number plates, or they need to steal number plates off other cars to put on their stolen cars. So Jonsk was a conscientious objector and had given his reason, I couldn't kill another human being. It was not just something he had said, he meant it in all seriousness. And suddenly here he was, one of the group of people who went about armed and let there be no doubt they would use their weapons. Hmm. He seems to be a bit morally conflicted on the subject. 
So in the middle of October 1971, Andreas Bader and Gudrun Essling came back to Berlin where initial preparations for a major RAF operation was about to be made. The idea was to kidnap the American, British and French city commandants all in one fell swoop. The rest of the group stayed in in Hamburg. One of their bases was an apartment on the Heberg in the Poopenbuttel area. So their hideout was in the Poopenbutt area. All right, great. Fuck it. Uh, (laughs) This is the word I told you about. Oh, I live in the (laughs) Poopenbutt. All right. Like, I I can't. I I, I just can't. It's it's too easy. Germany, what the fuck, man? (laughs) I know it means something completely <laughs> different, but they live in the poop and butt district. Uh, well, there's like those two dots over the U, so it's probably the poop and bootle. No, nah, it's poop and butt. It's, it's poop and butt. Poop and butt. I, I'm, di- uh, I'm disregarding the rules of the written language. <laughs> <laughs> um, later that month in Hamburg, Ulrike Meinhof, Margaret Schiller, Holger Mines, and uh, Gerhard were holed up in one of Margaret the safe Schitter houses. Margaret Schiller lived in the poop and butt area. Uh, we are 40 minutes into this episode and 33% through the script. <laughs> it was a long one, folks. So they were the apartment they were holed up in, the windows had been blocked and the place was in disarray. There were you know, documents everywhere, cigarette butts, you know. But Ulrika needed to make a phone call and because of their fear of wiretapping, they would need to use a public phone. They left the apartment that night at 1.30am and the evening was foggy. They had a complicated route that they needed to take in order to shake anyone following them. When Ulrika wandered off, Gerhard and, Ma- and Margaret noticed a car idling in the street with dimmed headlights. One of the passengers got out of the car and tried following the pair when they walked away, but lost them and returned to, the- to his car. The three of them were now aware that they were being watched by police and hid for a few minutes in some bushes and emerged once they thought the close- coast was clear. Suddenly, the car screeched into view and the police shouted at them to stay where they were. They tried to run away, but the police gave chase and caught up with them. Ulrika tried to take the pi- her pistol out of her purse, but, was, but had already been apprehended. She struggled with the police officer and shouted that they were armed. At this point, Gerhard Mueller turned, drew his pistol, and shot Sergeant Norbert Schmidt dead on the spot. Ulrika and Mueller disappeared, and Margaret Schiller stole the police car and drove away. Yes, so they finally killed someone. She was apprehended by the police at 2.30am and was promptly arrested and brought to the police station. It became clear that Margaret Schiller herself had not killed the policeman. Technical examination showed that her pistol had not been fired recently and Police Sergeant Lemke, who was with Schmidt, also stated that a man had fired at his colleague. At first suspicion fell on Holger Mines, who was already on the run. However, Lemke identified Gerhard Mueller as the marksman from police photographs. The woman with him was thought to be Imgard Moller. In fact, it had been Ulrika Meinhof. While the Hamburg police were combing the poop and bottle area, the wanted RAF members were sitting in the Heberg apartment. Poop and bottle. (sighs) Hiding in the poop and bottle. (laughs) Gotta gotta hide in that poop and bottle. Directly after the shooting, uh, some of them said later, Gerhard Mueller had rushed in with his revolver practically still smoking, boasting about having done in a cop. In the panic and terror of being discovered, they had all felt Manfred Grashoff, as the most senior person there, took over the organisation of security measures, a.k.a. staying in the apartment for three days and three nights, paranoid out of their mind and chain-smoking. I mean, yeah, I can kind of see um, why they would be doing this, other than, like, this is kind of a shitty security procedure, like, you're going to want to move. But at the same time... For I'm sure for a lot of them, they went from effectively LARPing as revolutionaries. Yeah, they're robbing banks and stuff, but that that's just basic criminal behavior to like, we actually killed a cop. Holy fuck, this is real. In the middle of November 1971, Ulrika Meinhof's foster mother, Renate Remek, wrote an open letter and published it in concrete, uh, Meinhof's previous employer, under the title, Give Up Ulrika, in order to encourage her to give up, you know, this life on the run and return home to her family, her kids, and, you know, back to normalcy. I think that ship has fucking sailed. When the Red Army faction shifted its field of operations back to Berlin, Hamburg sympathizers sent certain items of equipment after them by post. 
the parcels, at least 15 of them, were so badly packed that some of the ammunition fell out and the federal mail officials alerted the police and the entire consignment was confiscated. God. They've killed a guy and they're still dumber than shit. Well, like, this this isn't necessarily them. This is people, like, regular citizens sending stuff to them. Yeah, but it also it, it all it also speaks to the incredible unseriousness of some of their supporters. Like you're sending material support to a terrorist group. Um, you know, if this happened nowadays, that's almost a life fucking sentence. And maybe not in Germany. I have, I have no idea. Uh, but they're like, yeah, I'm just gonna throw <laughs> throw some loose handgun ammo in this M- Manila envelope and put it in the mail. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> Do you want to know what was in these packages? I would say mostly handgun ammunition, or did somebody try to say send something significantly more explodey? So the packages contained 16 Firebird and Parabellum pistols, three automatic rifles, their silencers and telescopic sights. Oh my god! 3,280 3, cartridges of different calibers, two walkie-talkie radio sets, ten wigs, any amount of artificial beards, a plastic bag containing car number plates of various lander of the Federal Republic, ampules of assorted drugs, and narcotics. Okay, imagine you're the guy that's trying to support the RAF with wigs, and you go to the like the local post office, and there's another guy with like a, like an H and K fucking assault rifle wrapped in paper. Like, oh, you're sending, you're just sending wigs. <laughs> 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 no it's like you know what uh at christmas when like someone's dad tries to like wrap up a bike in a way that it doesn't look like a bike but it still looks like a bike yeah it's just that but he has several guns under his shoulder and then someone comes <laughs> in like i'm sending them wigs uh, <laughs> i i missed the memo that we were sending them weapons uh i'll send beards too they're gonna do weaponized theater you know they're gonna do their own production of Hamlet or Othello. I mean, kind of. <laughs> so, uh, some other items included uniforms. This included the un- the uniform jacket of a Bavarian regional police officer, the jacket of Bavarian border police, and a first lieutenant's uniform. <laughs> Honestly, the, the, like the military uniforms would be really easy to come by since people, I'm 99% sure at the time men were conscripted into the the federal uh, military. Uh, So, like, a lot of those lying around. But also, in addition to this, there were some explodey bits, including 15 sticks of explosives and 16 detonators. I know know mailing rules were a lot looser back then, but (laughs) goddamn. Now you can't even buy weed on the darknet anymore. Fuck's sake. So, in response to these packages being found... 3,000 police officers were drafted in by the Berlin police to conduct checkpoints, searches, and identity checks. The police enlisted the aid of estate agents, property managers, filling stations, garages, key cutting services, and manufacturers of car number plates. And the public were requested to, particularly sharp, look out for any suspect BMWs. The search was on for members of the Red Army faction and the 2nd of June movement, another left wing paramilitary group that is, you know, going concurrently with the RAF and has quite a lot of crossover. Nobody thought that, like, maybe we should put, like, two or three more guys at the post office. Yeah, no. <laughs> you need, we need to arm the... Po- we need to arm the postman. Fuck it. Why not? Oh, wait. Nope. In the US, they already are armed. Uh, there's, like, a postal service SWAT team and shit. <laughs> so, on the 4th of December, 1971, a day after the operation had started, two police officers in an unmarked were following a van that had been reported stolen. They stopped the vehicle and another Volkswagen van, which had also been stolen. They had tried to arrest the occupants, but one of them tried to run away while the other three were being frisked. In the end, one was dead, shot by Bommy Bowman, a former friend of Andreas Bader and a leader in the 2nd of June movement. After more than a year and a half underground, and a year and a half mainly spent constructing and reconstructing a logistical system of cars, apartments, forged papers, as well as the necessary bank rates to finance it all, the RAF now planned to draw attention to its political aims with bomb attacks. Well, they certainly got enough stuff in the fucking mail. After the Berlin shooting incident, the BKA, this is the Federal Internal you know, Security Force, uh, stepped up you know, interior security. 
knowing that the Red Army faction's main sources of income were from bank robberies, they instructed branches to reduce the amount of cash on hand that they held. But the RAF had developed a strategy of transforming the fresh new banknotes that they had stolen into quote-unquote used money because at this point it was simply too dangerous for them to exchange the fresh notes that they were raiding from banks because they would be too easily recognized. Mm. The banknotes were rolled up, folded, refolded with dirty hands in one apartment. Well, that was probably uh, easy members for them. The, in, in one apartment, members of the group scattered notes on the floor and walked about on them for several days in muddy boots. Now and then they, they overdid it a little bit and tore the notes to pieces or left them scarcely recognizable anymore as valid currency. So, just before Christmas 1971, Dirk Hoff, a metal sculptor, had a visitor to his, you know, metal workshop, which was well equipped for artistic and craftsman work. And I assume Three building years er- bombs. Hold on to that. <sighs> oh, God damn it. Three years earlier, in 1968, he had met Holger Mines, then studying at the Berlin Film Academy, in an acquaintance's junk shop, and he had almost forgotten him. But that December day, Holger Mines suddenly turned up in his workshop. He gave Hoff a friendly greeting, you know, gave him a hug, a slap on the back, as if they were old acquaintances. At first, Hoff didn't remember him at all and asked him, you know, where was it we met? Oh, everybody knows you. You're known all over town, Holger Mines said. Holger Mines said he was currently working on a film project which needed some, which needed some technical work done on it. If Hoff was interested, he could have the job. And Hoff agreed. Holger Mines came back to the workshop sometime later with another young man, Jan Karl Rasp, who he introduced as Lester. Holger Mines had not given his own name either, but from you know conversations between the pair, Dirk Hoff gathered that he was called quote unquote Erwin. So Jan Karl Rasp gonna be referred to as Lester, Holger Mines, uh, or Holger Mines is gonna be referred to as Erwin. The three of them sat down on the upper floor of the two story workshop and talked about, you know, hippies and the subculture. They smoked a little hash, and Hoff showed them the pattern book illustrating several examples of his work, making many of these items resembling weapons. His two visitors seemed to think it was all very remarkable and offered Hoff the chance to make, uh, the chance of making the props for their film. The project might be delayed a little bit, but meanwhile, because he could construct a a piece of equipment uh, for the extraction of hollow metal pins, Holger Mines had brought an example with him, and Hoff agreed to make six of them. In fact, the item was a device for removing locks and breaking into cars. <laughs> so, a couple of days later, Holger Mines came back. He was just delighted with this device and paid him 200 Deutschmarks. Um, we're getting, we're going to get on with the film now, he told Hoff. We can think about the props, said Erwin. Hoff asked what the film was about. It's kind of a revolutionary fiction, Holger Mines replied. You couldn't find anything but rather primitive stuff in the usual props catalogues, he said. He showed Hoff the upper part of a hand grenade with its metal frame sprayed sky blue. And Mines explained how it should function and asked if he could make a version of, of the thing which would be rather more genuine and pack a much more of a punch on screen. Hoff made a couple, du- made, you know, 12 duplicates and was paid this is Deutsch the dumbest man on earth. You you want me to build a very convincing and powerful looking uh, but fake hand grenade? Sure. Hey, do- <laughs> don't ask. Um, Look, if you're a freelancer, man, I get it. Don't ask too many questions. You got to pay your bills. But sometimes it. So sometimes, like this, this person seems like a criminal. <laughs> yeah, don't don't ask uh, Alec Baldwin to uh, verify them. Yeah, I mean, he'll verify it. All right. We'll verify the shit out of it. Within the group, Hoff would be further referred to as the name Peach. Aw, he's got a thick, juicy ass. He got a great ass. (laughs) On the 2nd of December, 1971, at least four people raided the Fackelstrasse branch of the Mortgage and Exchange Bank in Kaiserlautum. They got away with around 100,000 Deutschmarks and and about 35,000 Deutschmarks worth of foreign currency. To ensure the smooth running of the operation, helpers had blocked the entrance of the police station near the bank with cars they had stolen short, shortly before the raid. It's a powerful skill to steal your own car barricade. <laughs> so, in the last episode, I, ta- I said 
you know, I'm going to talk a little bit more about how they went about these bank raids. So this is how this one went along. Started at 8 a.m., a red Volkswagen minibus stopped outside the bank and everyone except for the driver in it was wearing a balaclava already pulled down over their face, showing only the eyes, not even the mouth. Oh, it's got to stink. The whole balaclava just smells like old mouth. <laughs> they were all uniformly dressed in green parkas. They stormed into the bank with their pistols already drawn, immediately shouting, this is a raid, hands up, over by the wall. They would do this in every single raid. One of them vaulted over the foreign currency counter and cleared it out, while another one made for the main counter and stuffed money into his briefcase. The bank teller was ordered to open the safe, all going according to plan, like usual. Meanwhile, out in the street, a police officer just happened to be passing by, had noticed a red red Volkswagen minibus parked outside the bank, contrary to traffic regulations. And a guy wearing a fucking balaclava while driving. (laughs) No, the driver wasn't wearing a balaclava. It was literally just, oh, he's improperly parked. I need to go over and say something to him to get him to move the van. How German of him. Yeah. Uh, He went up to the passenger window and a shot was suddenly fired through from inside the vehicle. The policeman, Herbert Schoner, uh, was injured by flying flying glass from the window uh, on his throat and his face. The man in the driving seat fired a second shot, hit the policeman in the back. Severely wounded, the officer collapsed, but as he fell, he raised his pistol and returned fire. He dragged himself into the bank, and one of the bank robbers was crouching on the counter. He fired at the policeman. God, that has to suck. Your cop just gets shot, and you're like, oh, I have to crawl to safety, and you crawl directly into the bank in the middle of a robbery. Yeah. (laughs) What are the fucking odds? Um, Forensic experts after, after this say that it could have been any one of these three shots that killed him or a combination of all three. Without waiting for the safe to be opened, they all fucked off, leaving behind them a lady's handbag that had a cassette recorder in it, which they had placed on the table, switched on. They jumped into the minibus and and raced away. Next morning, 23rd of December, 1971, the Bill Zeytung came out with the headline, Bader Meinhof Strikes Again bank raid, policeman shot. So what you're seeing is like a real escalation and everything. Like things are like really, really picking up. And by January 1972, the political pressure to do something about the group was now at an all-time high. The Prime Ministers of West Germany under Willy Brandt, the federal chancellor, adopted sanctions against the members of the German Communist Party in order to prevent contamination within the government and the hunt for the RAF. It said, quote, if a candidate belongs to an organization which pursues aims that are at odds with the constitution, that membership is grounds for doubting whether he will always support the basic principles of the democracy. As a rule, these doubts will justify rejection f- of the application for a post. Was there any kind of a real connection between the Communist Party and the RAF? Because the RAF seems quite small. There, there was some, like, like you know, people sending those packages, they were receiving support from a lot of different areas and they they could have sent so, something to them. So the state were just kind of, you know, no, we're not dealing with any of you. On the 12th of February, 1972, eight Red Army faction members stormed the Ludwig Schaffen branch of the mortgage bank and got away with 285,000 Deutschmarks and they were disguised with carnival masks. <laughs> Well, it's good. That, it's good that they're playing with their fashion, you know. Yeah, they really said, "Oh, this time let's do a silly one." <laughs> they're, you guys are stupid. They're gonna be looking like they're gonna be looking for people dressed like revolutionaries. <laughs> At the same time, Hoff, codenamed Peach, was given more work to do. He was asked to create casings uh, that could be fitted into a vest. There was a scene in the film in which a woman was going to plant an explosive device in a lavatory where she would unfasten it from her belt and replace it un- and place it under her clothing with an inflatable balloon. Okay. <laughs> Peach is a fucking moron. Hoff made the improvised girdle, and when he showed it to Irwin and Lester, the two took turns uh, putting it on and walking around imitating a pregnant woman, laughing. So you just have these two dudes walking around like, oh, my back hurts, my feet are swollen. <laughs> All while holding a bomb carrier. Yeah. So next he was asked to modify a shotgun, which had already been sawed off on both the hit. What the fuck? Is it the hilt? That's, that would be a sword. 
No, what's the thing that goes against your shoulder? Buttstock. Okay. Um, Hoff, uh, next he was asked to modify a shotgun, which had already been sawed off on the barrel and the stock, and he turned it essentially into a self-loading machine gun that fired buckshot. Because they absolutely need this for a movie, right? Yeah. This is just like me filing my taxes saying like, yeah, I totally need this stuff for my job. <laughs> um, Hoff was uneasy with his creation. You think? You know, sometimes, you know, you just don't ask questions. You just get on with it. Look, I can kind of get everything up to illegally modifying a very real firearm. That one's too obvious. It's a prop. You know, it, 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 it's just a prop. It's just a toy. It's a prop that fires live shotgun ammunition. <laughs> <laughs> the, we're going to so, use this for a film in the future called Dust <laughs> yeah he was uneasy but he continued to work on everything on, fully believing it was used for you know props. I mean I would say that too if the cops were asking yeah so finally they asked him to screw detonators onto casings of hand grenades he was a specialist and despite his own objections they convinced him to do it since he had the technical skills and, you know, the delicate hands to do it and not blow them all to smithereens. Hoff refused uh, and went into the next room. Then Hold Your Minds undertook the dangerous job himself. And, you know, <laughs> Hoff, Hoff was surprised when he came back in at uh, how well he could handle the tools. Not a single one of the detonators went off. Don't worry, guys, I got this. So... A little later, uh, Hoff had another visitor. He was working and he heard the men's voices in the backyard and they, as they approached the workshop. He thought it could, it could be any of uh, the people who had just vis- visited him who had hitherto, you know, acted quiet and, you know, generally a little bit suspiciously. So when he opened the door to let Irwin and Lester in, they had another man with them. Uh, the third man had hair dyed uh, a pale blonde and wore a red winter coat. He was not introduced to Dierkoff, and without saying a word, he walked straight past him and into the workshop. He looked at all of the machinery, stopped, nodded, and went into the next room and looked at the lathe. While the strange man inspected his workshop, Dierkoff stood there with a weird, awkward feeling. Uh, it was if, you know, he had his boss checking on him. I think I may After- have accidentally given my metalworking facility to a terrorist group. <laughs> After around about half an hour and a few words the all three of them left the straight the do you want to know who the strange man was was it andreas botter yep <laughs> andreas botter whose hair was dyed blonde at this stage of course he, the, so, he's a graduate to stealing an entire factory yeah so by april the group had been busy building up their arsenal for com- for coming operations dirk hoff was you know making a lot of work cutting sections of metal pipes that could be used for casings Gerhard Mueller had spent the past few weeks in various cities buying several hundred kilos of chemicals such as red lead, aluminium, ammonium nitrate, potassium nitrate, potassium chloride, sulfur, charcoal, wood meal, glycerin, iron oxide, and different acids. He was also sourcing timers, batteries, and wires. Totally props. Yeah, you need all these to make a very convincing movie. Yeah. See, this is, you know, CGI has gotten rid of all the hard work that goes into practical effects that is needed, you know, to make something look real on screen. We're talking about Kino, baby. (laughs) So the the group were planning on making as many different types of bombs as possible in order to confuse authorities. That would work. Do you want to know how they process all of the, like, all of this material? I'm going to assume in an incredibly dangerous and irresponsible way. Yeah, using coffee grinders. Cool. Well done, boys. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, they broke down the bigger compounds in an apartment with uh, coffee grinders. The process was slow and you know, really laborious because the mills could only grind small amounts at the time. They tried using a bigger grinder, but just found that it wore out even quicker. Bear in mind... When they're grinding the stuff, the dust from it is everywhere. It's covered in explosive compounds at all times. Yeah, so Andreas Bader put, like, all of the coffee mills in buckets in order to, like, stop the dust going everywhere. Everybody's getting the black lung, but from constructing bombs in a small apartment. Yeah. So, by the end of this process, guess how much explosive materials they had. 
Probably less than they thought they would. 1,200 kilos. Holy fucking shit. <laughs> um, and they used household funnels to, like, you know, pour it into the bomb casings. Um, and, but they left the casings because, you know, safety first, you know, you want to be OSHA safe. The RAF uh, OSHA without... office is going to have their ass. <laughs> And they left them without the, you know, electric ignition systems, just to be safe. Um, now, in May 1972, the American Air Force uh, began, you know, mining and bombing harbors in North Vietnam. This was the catalyzing event for what was to come. On the 11th of May 1972, between 6.59 and 7.02 p.m., three pipe bombs blew up the entrance and officer's mess of the 5th U.S. Army Corps station in Frankfurt. 13 people were injured and one person died. The RAF's declaration of responsibility was signed, the Petra Schlem Commando, and said, West Germany and West Berlin will no longer be a safe hinterland for the strategists of extermination in Vietnam. They must know that their crimes against the Vietnamese people have made them new and bitter enemies, that, will, that there will be nowhere in the world left where they can be safe from the attacks of the revolutionary guerrilla units. On the 12th of May, soon, uh, a little bit after uh, half 12 uh, p.m., two explosive devices made from steel piping went off in two office cabinets in the Augsburg's police headquarters. Five policemen were injured. Two, out, two hours after the Augsburg's explosion, a Ford 21M loaded with explosives blew up in the car park of the Munich Regional Criminal Investigations Office. 60 cars were demolished. Windows were shattered on six floors. On the 15th of May, 1972, at 20 to 1, that's 12.40 p.m., <laughs> a, red, a red Volkswagen exploded in Karlsruhe uh, in the closest Strasse. It belonged to the federal judge, uh, Buddenberg, but his wife was at the wheel. And on the 19th of May, 1972, at about 3 p.m., a telephonist in the Springer building um, in Hamburg, you know, this is the right-wing publishing group, uh, a telephonist took a call. The voice on the other side of the line said, a bomb will go off in the building in five minutes' time. Do you want to know what she did? Hung up? Yeah, she ignored it. <laughs> <laughs> the woman didn't, she didn't take it seriously. You know, calls like this were really common at Springer headquarters. So it was just like, oh, it's another one of these weirdos. We got, a, you know? we got another bomb threat over here. Ha 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 You know, she engaged the caller in conversation and uh, hung up. They rang again. You swine, you never take anything seriously, said the man. Uh, she hung up again. <laughs> the telephonist took a few more calls, you know, and... Uh, then told the administrative office of the Springer building about the bomb threat. They were kind of like, eh, it's another bomb threat. Meanwhile, another call had come in and was taken by one of her colleagues. Once again, it was the same man, though in a rather, it was a man's voice, though rather high one saying, a bo so I was like, a bomb will go off in five <laughs> minutes time. So like Jordan Peterson rang it in. A bomb will go off in five minutes time. You're, you guys are not taking me seriously enough. Imagine how exasperated this fucking terrorist has to be. He's like, guys, I'm trying to fucking warn you. Get out of the bill. For the love of God. <laughs> Jordan Peterson, batter mine, huh? <laughs> you need to throw off your chains. The German state is fascist. <laughs> <laughs> You've invented a new worst form of Jordan Peterson. One who actually oh does something other than post online. Yeah, just, but like, you know, Jordan Peterson probably would have very much enjoyed being a left-wing revolutionary in the 70s, because you can take, like, all of the opiates you want, and it's not a big deal. I mean, and that, uh, I mean benzos are more his thing, but at the same time, he'd been a huge fan of RAF, because they had, like, a weird no-sex policy. It's like, I'm yeah. listening, please go on. Is there milking? In, <laughs> is there human milking in the RAF? <laughs> Your Peterson voice is really good. I unfortunately have done it a lot over the last couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> so Jordan Peterson on the other end of the phone uh, was furious. Clear the building at once. And then she hung up. <laughs> and uh, one of her colleagues asked, was it that crazy man again? The phone uh, rang again. 
It was like, you bloody, you bloody swine, you bloody swine. Then the caller on the other end hung up. At the, their patience is wearing thin. I have called in so many bomb threats to this fucking building and they're not listening to me. Nobody ever listens to me. <laughs> so then the first bomb exploded in the proofreading room. There was 15 proofreaders working there. Most of them suffered injuries. Soon afterwards, two other bombs hidden in the toilets went off. And all 17 people were injured, two of them seriously. Okay, I'm not, I'm not laughing at the, uh, at the people being injured, of course. That's terrible. But the idea that, like, no, we have to sequentially blow up all of their toilets. <laughs> You're, re- you, like, taking blowing up the bathroom way too seriously. <laughs> it, the, it's the, the tried and true, like, 80s teen comedy prank of lighting, uh, like, a firework and dropping it in the toilet at school. Except, you know, they 17 fed- people are wounded. <laughs> they just fed Andreas Baller, like... 1500 Deutschmarks of Taco Bell and somehow snuck him into the bathroom. We will always remember you as a as our crunch rap supreme martyr. <laughs> Taco Bell Juche. Um so the next day another anonymous caller rang. There are more bombs in the building and the police are all fools. They're looking in the wrong places. And to be fair, the police did find three more bombs in the building. How the fuck did they get so many bombs in this place? One near the press, the printing presses, one in the management offices, and one in a cupboard containing cleaning materials. The bombs were all, you know, disposed of. Two days later, a letter was sent to the German press agency. Springer would rather see his workers and clerical staff injured by bombs than risk losing a few hours working time, which means profit over a false alarm. To capitalists, profit is everything and the people who create it are dirt. We are deeply upset to hear that workers and clerical staff were injured. Look, I'm not saying I disagree with the core tenets of what they're saying here. What I'm saying here is this is the fault of a shitty secretary. (laughs) On the 24th of May uh, at 6.10pm, it's 10 past 6, two car bombs went off within 15 seconds of each other outside Barracks Block 28, uh, and at the mess of the European headquarters of the US Ar- Army in in Heidelberg, three were killed in the attack. And like this, like this bomb is that's a big fucking deal. It's so gruesome as well. It blew like it collapsed. You know, parts of the building. People were like trying to get out, but the doors had like essentially been like blown shut, and the glass was shattered out. And, like, they had to climb out over the broken glass in the door, so they were, like, completely sliced up. There was one soldier who, one of the ones who died, was crushed to death by a Coca-Cola machine. Oh, God, that's a fucking horrible way to go. It's gotta be Pepsi. That Coca-Cola blood. I, I can only, like, that's fucking terrible, man. And, like... They are once again spilling Coca-Cola blood. Uh, imagine, like, man, thank God I'm stationed in Germany. I didn't get sent to Vietnam. And your barracks building shakes. Oh, no. The the most, like, gruesome one was a dude who... So, a lot of the, like, immediate stuff was reported by a German ambulance driver who was nearby and saw the bombs go off. He said there was one soldier who had essentially had all the skin on his face peeled off and was essentially scalped by the explosive force of the bomb. Good God. Yeah. So, five days after the Heidelberg attack, all of the leaders of the Regional Special Commissions Committee, Special Commissions Committees and representatives of the Federal Border Police were briefed on a nationwide search, the scale of which had never been seen before. To all intents and purposes, the entire police force were placed under the command of the Federal Criminal Investigations Office for a single day, and they were given the go-ahead. Yeah. On the 31st of May, 1972, Operation Water Splash was undertaken. And Water Splash? Ha- so was someone, like, using the urinal and accidentally splashed it the wrong way? It's like, I have an idea. You know that all of these operations, 90%, 99% of the time, have dumb names. That's true. So, 31st of May, all available helicopters in the public service in West Germany were all in the air. Each had a group of police officers on board. They flew over the motorways, coming down briefly at junctions to set up roadblocks, stop all vehicles, and check up on their drivers. Then the officers took to their helicopters again, flew a little further, set up another roadblock. This caused 
absolute traffic chaos. I can imagine they shut down like every fucking highway in a country. Yep. So, didn't work. They didn't find them. But, even before Operation Water Splash, the BKA had received a tip-off from a Frankfurt residence of some suspicious activity going on in a garage nearby. Um, The police then went and scoped it out, saw there was buckets filled with a lot of, like, you know, grey powder, and one evening they snuck in after dark and took samples of it for testing, and it confirmed their suspicions that it was explosive material. They returned the buckets that they had taken the following night and set up surveillance for the garage. Or garage. I said fucking garage. Fuck <laughs> You're assimilating, but only for the podcast. On the 1st of June... 1972, the day after Operation Water Splash, at 5.50am, the officers noticed three men driving a purple-coloured Porsche the r- driving the wrong way up a one-way street, and they eventually arrived at the garage where they had le- they where they all left the car and went inside. The third man, young Carl Rasp, stayed outside on guard. Two police officers from the surveillance squad approached in their car and through their side window they told Rasp to stay where he was. Rasp put his hand in his right pocket and drew a pistol. He just rolled down their window and yelled at them. Yeah. (laughs) So at this moment two more policemen came uh, running up from the adjoining street. Young Carl Rasp ran a few meters towards them, fired from a distance of about 28 meters. One of the officers threw themselves behind a parked car and the other one dived into uh, into the car for safety. Rasp ran on past the buildings making for a garden where Chief and, uh, Superintendent Irgel cornered him. Rasp put up no resistance on being arrested and a 9mm parabellum was found on him. Four months later a schoolboy discovered a Smith & Wesson revolver in the garden earth that young Kyle Rasp had buried uh, just before he was arrested. So he was running towards where he had buried the second gun. <laughs> <laughs> he was going to try and like John Wick, you know, Max Payne himself out of the situation. Yeah, little known fact, urban gorillas actually have bullet time. <laughs> You're just activating dead eye, you know. <laughs> All the X's just appear on everyone. Um so when Bader and Mines heard the gunshots, they were they went to the door to see what was going on. And when Mines poked his head outside the door, a police officer 50 15 meters away was pointing a submachine gun directly at his head telling him to go back inside the police then pushed a car in front of the door in order to blockade the pair inside Bader fired through the cl- through the closed right hand side of the garage door but no one was hit soon reinforcements arrived and began knocking the glass out of the windows and setting up sniper positions but this is a building literally just full of explosives we're gonna get there <laughs> Just literal buckets of explosives lying around. What this is kind of funny. So one officer that could see into the garage was uh, had to report what he saw, and everyone was expecting them to be freaking out. You know, like oh, shit. What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? What he saw was the two of them surprisingly calm, smoking cigarettes, laughing and joking, and occasionally pointing their pistols towards the police. What the fuck? <laughs> Just having a laugh with the boys. Yeah. So tear gas was thrown in through the open windows that had been broken out and over a loudspeaker, they were told to surrender and they would not be hurt. They threw explosives into a house full of explosives. So throw your pistols and your other weapons out into the yard, put your hands up and come out one by one and you won't be hurt. Well, we have more patience than you do, much more, and we're in a better situation. We have a stronger forces at our disposal. They are on their way. They're so strong that you have no chance left. So come out. What what do you think you're doing skulking in there? What do you think the the two of them did at this point? I imagine they wrote some letter back shit talking them or something because I don't see how they can get out of this exactly. This is the only time I'm gonna be like, you know what, Andreas Bader's really cool. Um, Bader and Mines pushed open one side of the door against the Audi. The police, you know, thinking that they're about to surrender, pulled the car away with a rope. Uh, after that, the garage door was a little bit more open and uh, opened a little bit more wider from the inside so that the tear gas could drift out. Andreas Bader began throwing the tear gas grenades back out. <laughs> hey, anybody who's ever been in a protest knows what he's doing. He was standing near the front of the garage uh, on the right, leaning against the metallic uh, sports car parked there. And uh, 
in one hand he had his revolver and in the right hand he had a cigarette. <laughs> this guy is never not smoking. Like, that, that is just so cool. Uh, like, throwing tear gas grenades back out at the police while smoking at the same time with a gun. The man knows his priorities. You know, it, it's like the thing, you know, if you break off cigarette filters and shove them up your nose, then, you know, and you cover your eyes, tear gas really can't uh, do a whole lot. I mean, it's very unpleasant. Regard- I, I, I don't recommend anybody does that. <laughs> <laughs> so at 7.45, the order uh, was called out to go in. The police tried to unsuccessfully ram the doors closed in order to make the tear gas work better. It didn't work. Uh, Andreas Bader instead aimed his gun at the police and started shooting. And the wind, uh, which began to pick up at this time, started blowing the tear gas into the police's eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so they were forced to momentarily retreat back a little bit. But then they slowly moved their cordon closer and closer to the garage. And some officers moved to a third floor observation post where a sniper took aim and the and Bader and Mines were given one last warning, to which they told them to fuck off. And then the sniper obliterated Andreas Bader's thigh with a single shot, ending the siege. That'll do it. Uh, oh, oh no, my legs. My doctor told me not to get shot in them. Yeah. Now, once again, they were told, you know, to just come out and surrender um, and throw their guns out. Hold, hold. Holger Mines came out of the garage with his hands up. He was ordered to stay there, stay where he was, strip to his underpants, and come out to the exit of the yard. <laughs> there was already cameras and media waiting, and the pictures of the skinny, almost emaciated, naked figure of Holger Mines went around the world instantly. And Red Army Faction sympathizers and those close to them were reminded of the pictures of concentration camp inmates. The myth of the pitiless persecution of the Red Army Faction warriors was born. Now, Bader, on the other hand, was on the floor of the garage with a shattered thigh, still holding his pistol and a cigarette. <laughs> He's, oh, I have to put a cigarette in this wound. That's the only thing I know how to do. So um, he was stretchered out by the police, brought to an ambulance, all the while thrashing and screaming at the police, calling them swine. I mean, that's more than I'd be saying at that moment. I would just be mostly screaming in unimaginable pain. With this, two members of the Red Army faction were now in custody. On the 7th of June, exactly a week after Andreas Bader's arrest, the manager of a boutique in Hamburg was standing by the cash desk when a young woman came into the shop. She was wearing a red sweater, had curly, shoulder-length hair, and was very, very thin. The manager looked hard at the woman who replied with a smile. She didn't really seem that well. She, The manager was kind of worried about her. And uh, she took off her jacket and asked to see several sweaters. Another customer had been trying on 10 or 15 pairs of trousers in the shop and left them scattered on the couch. The manager went to put the trousers back where they'd come from and in doing so she noticed the blue-grey leather jacket uh, that was owned by the shopper and was about to clear that away too to hang it up, you know, get it nice and out of the way and tidy. But the jacket kind of struck her as like unusually heavy and uh, she felt it's she felt one of the pockets and uh, turned to her colleague in the shop and said, I think there's a gun in there. And they both kind of, you know, chuckled a little bit. But uh, one of them put their hand inside the jacket and pulled out the gun. (laughs) (laughs) So they called the police and with that, a very, very stressed out Gudrun Ensling was arrested by police. He was defeated by shopkeepers. So now there is three of the four main people of the Red Army faction in prison. And this is the end of our part three, but there's one little thing that I want you to, you know, hear. Remember when you said about you could probably tell when something was written by Andreas Bader? Yes. So on the 7th of August, 1972, police officers searched you know, a hideout in Stuttgart. And the detective superintendent uh, uh, wrote an official report, and it reads as follows. Regarding hunt for violent anarchist criminals subject conspirators apartment at 71 Siedenstrasse. Attached. Two Mickey Mouse comic books. The attached Mickey Mouse comic books were found in the above-mentioned apartment 
they are there are good grounds for suspecting that these Mickey Mouse books were read by the gang member Andreas Baller. He was just chilling out reading Mickey Mouse comic books. Yeah. yeah. Who's among us? <laughs> Bomb the barracks. Ho ho! Ho ho! You need to kill the American Imperials! Ho ho! <laughs> And with that, we end part three of the RAF series. They're in prison. There's going to be a lot of prison talk in the fourth episode. I I don't even know where to begin on this one, other than it is exceeding, uh, exceedingly hilarious that a member of a revolutionary group is defeated by a clothing shop, like, cashier. Yeah, like, at this stage, they were just, you know, exhausted after a year and a half underground. Now, bear in mind, this is... 1972 there is probably another six or seven years that we need to cover in part four but if any of you are familiar with this story the majority of this concerns a lot of court stuff which we're going to be you know trying to condense in order to not make the episode like four hours long joe what what do you what do you think about the red army faction now since you didn't know anything about them in part one it's kind of shocking how successful they were. You know, they 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 were incredibly. I mean, of course, defining in your definition of successful, their their goal was to kill agents of the uh, of the state, both West German and American, and they certainly succeeded at doing that. And they managed to do it in the dumbest way possible. It's like the kind of thing that could only exist in the seventies. Yeah, it's real failing upwards energy. Uh, they they get mailed fucking assault rifles and shit they get they get the world <laughs> dumbest prop guy to build them bombs yeah uh it, it's it's the kind of like i said it's the kind of stuff it's definitely a product of its time it's the kind of like how carlos the jackal couldn't exist today <laughs> but yep if you enjoyed this uh episode and you want to hear more listen back to our other episodes with a lot of them have me and Joe on it. If you want to hear more of me, listen to Beneath the Skin. It's the show about the history of everything told through the history of tattooing. I don't monologue as much in that show as I do on this one. And uh, Joe, plug your books, plug your show that I am hosting right now. If we'll, if you like what we do here on the Lines Led by Donkeys podcast, consider supporting us on Patreon. You get episodes like this one before everybody else. Uh, you get five plus years of back bonus content, including miniseries, movies, other history shows. Uh, you get books, you get stickers, Discord access, all kinds of stuff. Um, so support us on Patreon and leave us a review and wherever it is you listen to podcasts, it helps us immensely. If you like military-related things or science fiction, consider buying one of my books where you can find them anywhere that you purchase your other books. And until next time... Hide in the the poop and.